Hello everyone, and welcome back to Total Organic Chemistry. This video, I will be doing an introduction to conjugated systems, and then looking at two main reactions, allylic halogenation and substitutions. By the end of this video, the questions that you should be able to answer are, how does delocalization of electrons occur? How do I perform allylic halogenation? And how do allylic halides undergo SN2 reactions? If you'd first like a review of alkenes that are non-conjugated, please go ahead and subscribe to my channel and take a look at my video on that topic. Let's take a look here at this molecule here. This is propene. So we have three carbons and this double bond between the one and two carbons. If I take some strong base here and abstract this hydrogen on the sp3 hybridized carbon, then I can move this pair of electrons down to the carbon here, which gives me a negative formal charge on this carbon. So usually we know that the pKa of alkanes, in this case, is around 50, so this is going to be a very unfavored reaction. However, we can do something special with this type of alkene. So we can move this electron pair down to form a double bond between these two carbons, and then at the same time take this already formed double bond and move that pair of electrons up to this other carbon, giving us now the negative formal charge on the left-hand carbon. And I've drawn a double-headed arrow to signify that this is a resonance. So that means that we can draw the resonance hybrid here, where we have our three carbon chain, and now we have a dotted line in between all three carbons because that double bond is delocalized. And we also have partial negative charges on the one and three carbons. If you'd like some review on drawing resonance structures, please go ahead and take a look at my video at the top of the screen. But because we can move this double bond and the electron pair around on the molecule, that's called electron delocalization. So instead of having a localized double bond and electron pair, we can actually move these throughout the molecule, which means that instead of a pKa of about 50, like we would expect from normal sp3 hybridized carbons, the pKa of allylic hydrogens, so allylic means one carbon removed from the double bond, is about 40, so 10 orders of magnitude more acidic than a normal alkane. If we wanted, we can also draw an image of the molecular orbitals involved in this allylic system. So I can draw the three carbon chain, and because we have the double bond delocalized across all three carbons, each of those carbons will have some empty p orbital character, which I can draw with these lobes here. And because those p orbitals are all adjacent to each other, we get the electrons can move around freely between those three orbitals. And this lends extra stability to the molecule, and this applies not only with anions, like I've shown in this example, but also with cations and radicals, which we'll take a look at in a second. So what kinds of reactions can I use to take advantage of this extra stability of allylic conjugated systems? Well, if I take the same molecule, this propene, and react it with some halogen, so I'll just write X2, and then some radical initiator, so I can write ROOR if we want to use some organic peroxide, or we could also use some ultraviolet light, H nu. And while you might remember from my video on radical halogenation of alkenes, we might be able to get that halogen to add directly to the alkene, giving an anti-Markovnikov addition. However, if we keep the concentration of halogen low, then we can actually get this product, which is halogenated at the allylic position. So we maintain the double bond between those two carbons, and now we have the X on the allylic carbon. So what is the mechanism of this reaction? Well, let's use bromine as an example. We start with our Br2 molecule, and we know that by using some ultraviolet light or maybe a peroxide, we can homolytically cleave this bromine-bromine bond, and that will give me two bromine radicals. Then if I have my propene here, and I can explicitly draw in the allylic hydrogen, we know that this carbon-hydrogen bond is weaker than it would normally be for an alkane, so the bromine radical can attack that carbon-hydrogen bond, breaking the CH bond homolytically, so we have one electron forming a bond with the bromine, and the other going onto the carbon to form a radical. So from this we produce one molecule of HBr in the process, and we also end up with this allylic radical. 
And you might think that this radical might not be very stable because it's a primary radical, and we know that primary radicals are not very stable. We prefer to have maybe tertiary radicals instead. But because this radical is in the allylic position, adjacent to the double bond, that actually makes it even more stable than a regular primary radical. So this allows it to proceed in the reaction, where we can have another molecule of Br2, and then that bromine-bromine bond is relatively weak again, so we can have the radical from the hydrocarbon come up here to break the Br-Br bond homolytically, so we have one electron moving towards the radical, and then forming one other bromine radical in the process. And then that forms the carbon-bromine bond to make the final product, the allylic bromide. Then we could possibly imagine this bromide radical that we just created could eventually go on to propagate this process, but also could participate in a termination step where we have two bromine radicals together, forming one molecule of Br2. However, this is going to be very rare, and it's going to eventually quench our reaction, which we don't want. Another question you might have is how do we keep the concentration of halogen low enough to prevent addition to the alkene, where we're actually looking for the allylic halogenation? Well, one common technique is to use NBS, and this stands for N-bromosuccinamid, which is this cyclic molecule here. And this is often in a solution of carbon tetrachloride. And it turns out that this is a very good source of low concentrations of bromine. And this is obtained through impurities of HBr. So I can write that in parentheses to know that that is already going to be in our solution. And this actually forms, like I said, low quantities of bromine, which can then go on to react in our allylic halogenations. So let's look at a slightly more complicated alkene. We can look at this 4-carbon alkene and then use our NBS to perform the allylic halogenation. So I can write NBS, and then maybe we can use an organic peroxide this time, and in carbon tetrachloride as a solvent. And let's draw the mechanism for this to find out the products. Well, if we start with our alkene, we know that this is going to be happening at the allylic position, so I'll draw out this hydrogen explicitly. And then we know that we have our bromine radical formed from the NBS, and the organic peroxide. So this will break the CH bond homolytically to give off one molecule of HBr, and then getting this allylic radical here. And so one product that might be immediately apparent is where the bromine is captured by that allylic radical directly. So that will give us this product, where we have the alkene on the terminal position and the bromine in that allylic position. However, we can also form another product. So if you notice, remember that anions are not the only thing that's stabilized by delocalization, so we can also stabilize radicals. So what it can do is have this single electron here move to form a double bond between these two carbons, and then this will break the double bond homolytically, giving one electron to form this double bond between the two and three carbons, and the other going to the terminal carbon. So this is in resonance with this structure here, where we have now the double bond between the two and three carbons and the radical on the primary carbon. And then finally we can imagine capturing this radical with some bromine to give this product, where the bromine is now on the terminal carbon. And for bonus credit, you can even notice that this is going to be isomeric with the cis alkene. So we'll get some sort of mixture with the trans and cis alkenes. So when performing these types of allylic halogenations, it's important to realize that our charge or our radical is going to be delocalized throughout several carbons, so in many cases that can lead to a mixture of products. One last thing I want to mention is allylic substitutions. So we could go back a little bit to SN2 reactions and think about this reaction here. So this is propyl chloride, so this is a primary alkyl halide, and treating it with some NaOH could give us a good yield of this product. This is N-propanol. So we know that SN2 reactions occur quite readily with primary alkyl halides and good nucleophiles like the OH-. However, if we have a similar alkyl halide, so now adding the double bond, this is called allyl chloride, 
and treating it in the same conditions with some sodium hydroxide will also give this substituted product. So this is allyl alcohol. And although this is also a primary alkyl halide, we can notice that it is also conjugated. So what this means is that this allyl product will form much faster than the first product in the other reaction. So it turns out that allylic halides are actually even better substrates for SN2 and SN1 reactions than their corresponding non-conjugated counterparts. And that is something we can use to our advantage in organic synthesis that I might discuss in some future videos. But until then, I hope you liked this video on allylic halogenation and substitution. Please like this video and subscribe to my channel. Also visit my Facebook page and take a look at my website on the screen. Finally, if you're willing and able, consider donating to my Patreon page, which helps me to continue creating all of these content for all of you. Thanks for watching.